So for those who aren't aware of your ship, Dan Abnett is like... Oh, we didn't kill this guy, apparently. Oh, we just fucked his face up and, and left him to die at his own feast. And he's mad about it. I thought it very clearly said he died, but maybe we didn't finish the job. Isn't this part of the nemesis system, though, is occasionally guys that we thought we killed will come back with weird facial scars Makes or like sense. grudges yep. against us? Or... That's a really cool system. I'm into this. Yeah. For those who aren't aware of viewership, Dan Abnett is one of the Doctor and I's collectively favorite writers. So he primarily writes um, fiction for the Black Library, which is the, the fiction house for the Warhammer 40,000 novels, basically. Uh, he writes a bunch of other things. He's written a bunch of really good comic books. In fact, he wrote most of the comics that the current Guardians of the Galaxy movies are based on. Huh. I didn't know he did anything with Marvel. Oh yeah, he's a big comic book writer. He's a really talented writer. Um, he actually took a job. He's written a Mr. Man book. <laughs> what because, the fuck? Because he literally... Whoa, he just blew things up. Did he just blow me up? Whoa. Okay, so he's clearly got some kind of explosive crossbow. That's worth knowing. And our man, Nakrath the Skullbow, is terrified of that guy because he fucking legged it when he turned up. Oh, Eminem's leveled up as well. Oh no, the real. We've got to go and fight the real Slim Shady. <laughs> <laughs> well, this guy's got a lot of. Yeah, he's terrified of Hawk the Merciful. Oh, that, that's kind of cool that like, he's, he's evolved as a character. I like that. Yeah. In any case, like, um. To finish off our point about Dan yeah. Abner, he got a job writing one of the Mr. Men and Little Mrs. books. <laughs> so that, j on, only so he could put on his CV that he's written everything from the X-Men to the Mr. Men. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant. It is brilliant. And I, I'm pretty pleased that he wrote the dialogue for this. That's, that's tremendous. Right, I'll give you, I'll give you some options now. What do we want to do? Um, one of our human allies has got a plan to draw the Black Captain's attention to Udon, but is going to need more men to accomplish it. Um, we have got Ratbag's hunger for power is, is growing keep him alive so he can bring us closer to the Black Hand, or investigate Gollum and what he's do it, what he's on about with the Bright Master. Um, the, the most compelling thing to me sounds to be like more Gollum stuff. We've seen a lot of hacking orcs to bits. Let's do some Gollum-y things. So, like, it's the Black Captain, the Black Hand. I think so. I may have said, I, it may have all said Black Hand and I said Black Captain because I was thinking of, oh, okay. of, of the Lord of the Rings shit. Because, of course, like the, the Black Captain... The, yeah, in, the Lord of the Nazgul. Yeah, exactly. Which is basically... The Nazgul, like... Sorry, go on. Oh, no, please, go for it. No, I was just going to say a point we made before on another recording, so go for it. So... The Nazgul spring in, like, completely unprompted in, like, Tolkien's early drafts. Like, I think it's like his second ever draft of Fellowship. Where, um, he describes Gandalf coming down the road. So originally Gandalf was going to meet the Hobbits, like, the day after they leave Bag yeah. End. And he writes a description of, like, um, a man and a horse bundled up in, um, like, furs and bundled up in, like, cloth so you, you couldn't see who it was. And they were going to get surprised. And then they were going to find out it was Gandalf and everything was going to be great. Mog Scar artist. I mean, yeah, they kind of reference that in the actual um, thing where they're like, what if it's Gandalf? Oh, then we'll surprise him when they're like getting off the road quick. Yeah, that's actually dialogue from very early on in some of Tolkien's drafts. Like, it, it's remarkable how often he puts pen to paper and just writes for paragraph after paragraph what will eventually make it into fellowship, but will still start from scratch the moment he doesn't like someone's name or the moment he decides, actually, I don't like this that they took three extra days to get from point A to point B. He'll just start the whole story from scratch. So the first time he ever puts pen to paper, he writes the, the Bilbo Baggins speech at the party where it's, I like less than half of you half as well as I should yeah. like, and, less, and more than half of you half as well as you deserve, or whatever it is. The first time he ever starts to write Lord of the Rings, we get that line. Huh. Which is just, so, just that, so strange. It's, it's fascinating to me just how much of this springs relatively fully formed from from Tolkien himself like the, like as you say maybe it's just that he didn't document his drafty stuff that well but the fact that he just it, it just appears like that it's really cool because like some of it is just absolute dynamite like there's some sections in there that make it right into fellowship the first time he ever writes yeah. it which is frankly incredible but then obviously and you then, don't know how like he might have been you know turning that over in his mind for a decade before that point Possibly. One of the things that struck me was how long it took him to write The Lord of the Rings. I know it's a big fantasy series, 
But it occurred to me, like, because he starts writing in 1937, and Lord of the Rings is published in the early 50s. That's a long ass time. I didn't realize it was early as 37 that it started. Yeah, I think he really struggled to get it going. What did so, he, um, a, what did he do during the war? Was he just, as in the Second World War? Was he? I think he was in code. He was in code breaking. Yeah, I had a fear, fear, feeling it was something like that. But like, it, it does. It, they haven't gotten to that stage right in the um, the history of Lord of the Rings, the, the book that I'm reading just now. We haven't gotten to his war years yet. It's 1940, and like, there's no mention of what he's doing to help the war yeah. effort. But. But I can kind of imagine that for the six years that was happening, I don't imagine he was very Not getting a productive. great deal um, done, yeah. Uh, the outbreak of war seems to have been profoundly depressing for well, him. Well, he, he fought in the First World so, War, didn't he? He fought in the trenches. He did. He was he was at the Somme. Jesus. Just, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the, the I fact that we even got Lord of the Rings is... Mm. You do wonder with, you uh, know, the Somme having something like a 60% fatality rate, how many other people like Tolkien would just moan down there? Oh, it, it's Like how, how much like, stuff, like, humanity is, has collectively lost from just the people that were killed there. It's oh, yeah. depressing. An, an, entire genera- an entire generation of, like, really, really bright young men. Oh, fuck. Like, just boys that we sent to go yeah. down the trenches. Oh, no, we're, we're about to get murdered no, again. But yeah, like um, he was he was military. I, I mean, conscription was a thing yeah. he had to be. But um, yeah, he went off to fight at the Somme, and it obviously had a profound impact. Some might say on his writing or on his worldview. Yes, I think I'd be I'd be, I'd be shocked me. by anyone who was physically present at the Somme and it not having a profound impact on their entire life from that point onwards. Because that was a point where, like, oh, turns out war isn't exactly the big glamorous thing it is, which is kind of why it's in some ways almost impressive how much of of Lord of the Rings still does kind of glorify war and, you know, the want to, to, to die for your what you believe in and that kind of thing, because a lot of people left the Somme thinking that was a bad move. Yeah. For those who aren't aware of viewership, like, the Somme, I hope most people do, but it's a horrendous trench battle fought in the early years of the First World War. Uh, it's considered by many to be the, the greatest military disaster in Europe that has ever taken place, really. Like, just a horrendous conflict. Yeah, and I mean, if you and if you see the like, numbers on the on the Somme, they're like in a single day, like twenty thousand men are killed. Like it's it's awful. It's a oh, cut, fuck's sake. We've made cut down just as Italian was. Yeah. But yeah, it's only it's the Somme is arguably the point where people kind of realise with the First World War. Oh, turns out war is not the thing it used to be. This is not a few guys going yeah. at each other with swords. This is like. Thousands of men can just mow each other down with artillery and machine guns. It was just that that switch, I suppose, from you know single shot rifles and a, an officer class of soldiers who were leading like commoners who had nothing better to do to like an industrial scale of total war that had never. I know been you're seen a fan of the history. Behind the Bastards podcast. Oh yeah, have I you am. listened Huge to? Fan. There's a recent one about exactly that. Yeah, about, the, um, the ma- and the development of the Maxim yeah, machine gun. About how much the machine gun just it, changed everything. Yeah, I didn't realize that like Maxim machine guns. So like by the end of the First World War, they had machine guns that could fire a thousand rounds yeah, in a minute. It's and unthinkably and, uh, and destructive. As you say, the speed at which it happened that literally within you had people whose fathers fought hand to hand, maybe with a temperamental rifle, but they themselves were you know manning guns that could you know. Cannons that could shoot fifty miles away, and and guns that could shoot a thousand rounds a minute. Like the pace of technological change and how that changed warfare. Whereas those older men who you know came to power fighting hand to hand were still the ones making the military decisions. Is the problem where they're like, oh yeah, war is an honourable and noble thing. It's like not for the fourteen-year-olds who are dying in the mud like that. Correct. Uh, the really disturbing thing to me is like Winston Churchill's life. So at the start of Churchill's life, he was a lancer in the Boer War. So like I'm literally a man who fought on horseback with a spear. And by the end of his life, 1945, they're dropping atomic yeah. weapons that could kill tens of thousands. It, it's unthinkable how quickly industrial war advanced. Yeah. But yeah, the, the, the Somme, Tolkien, Tolkien fought in it. You might think this had some kind of impact on his impressions for Lord of the Rings. We can maybe unpick that more later in this series, I think. But... Yeah, suffice to say, when war was declared in 1939, all progress in Lord of the Rings haunted, like, halted for like yeah. a year. Uh, he, he wrote a letter to his publisher talking about, like, with the impending disaster, I find it very, very difficult to go on. 
and uh, perhaps like somewhat poignantly, he stops at exactly the point the Fellowship makes it to Balin's tomb. Yeah. Which is just, it makes it all the sadder that like this man who had experienced so much awful conflict couldn't advance his life's work further, and it stops right at the point where we're confronted with the first <laughs> real death yeah. in The Lord of the Rings. Do you know the story of Tolkien with the Nazis? No. <laughs> so the Nazis um, wrote to Tolkien, basically saying, "Oh my you've, God, you've written some some good works of, of of strong white European fiction, essentially, <laughs> or at least that, that was they knew his work on that, and they basically talked about. They tried to get him on on, on board, um, and there's a there's an open letter. Google it and see if you can find it, because it's certainly kicking around his his response letter, uh, which is fucking fantastic. Oh my God, I certainly will. Of Tolkien basically saying like. D d d you've misunderstood a lot of the importance of any of my work and writings and academic career if you think I'd be supporting this kind of thing but obviously like so Hitler was a big fan of Richard Wagner for example Richard Wagner himself colossal anti-Semite um, uniquely terrible person um, like there's a whole, you know, oh, well, you know, that's just what people were like for, for his time. Richard Wagner was particularly anti-Semitic for his time. Whenever he was, because uh, he was also a conductor as well as a, as a composer, whenever he was conducting anything written by Jewish musicians, he would wear gloves to conduct it. Like, he was grade A bellend, and unsurprisingly, Hitler fucking idolised him. Yeah, I know that, like... Wagner's operas had like I think we spoke about this in the last um, Lord of the Rings like show that we did, but yeah, I know that there was a huge resurgence under the Nazis of yeah. Wagner's operas, for example. I mean, yeah, in some ways, it's hard to talk about Lord of the Rings without spending at least a little bit of time on Wagner because of how much it's influenced it. I found that extra. So this was I have no idea, but this is incredible. <laughs> oh my god! So. In 1938, the Nazis demanded to know if the Hobbit author, like Tolkien, was Jewish. He responded with a high-class burn, according to this article. If you can find and actually read his response, it's worth reading to, like, to the audience in its entirety, because it's fantastic. Because obviously it's Tolkien, so it's there bloody well-written. <laughs> there is, like, um... There is here like an excerpt from it. So it says, Dear Sirs, thank you for your letter. Full stop. I regret that I am not clear as to what you mean by Irish. I am not of Aryan extraction, semicolon. That is Indo-Iranian. <laughs> so like, he's taking them to tire of their fucking grammar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. Okay, let's, let's go down and see if I can find out more of this letter. Oh, here we go. I've got the rest of it here. So... I am not of Aryan extraction, that is indo iranian as far as I'm aware. None of my ancestors spoke Hindustani, Persian, Gypsy, or any related dialects. But if I'm to understand that you are inquiring whether or not I'm of Jewish origin, I can only reply that I regret that I appear to have no ancestor of that gifted people. <laughs> my great-great-grandfather came to England in the 18th century from Germany. The main part of my descent is therefore purely English. I am an English subject. That would be sufficient. <laughs> I have been accustomed, nonetheless, to regard my German name with pride and continue to do so throughout the period of the late regrettable war in which I served in the English army. This is fantastic. <laughs> I am... Well, can we please... We'll link this somehow yeah. to viewership because this is great. I'm going to keep reading it. I cannot, however... Forbear to comment that if impertinent and irrelevant inquiries of this sort are to become the rule in matters of literature, then the time is not far distant when a German name will no longer be a source of pride. Your inquiry is doubtless made, in, doubtless made in order to comply with the laws of your own country, but that this should be held to apply to the subjects of another state would be improper, even if it had not, as it has not, any bearing whatsoever on the merits of my work or its suitability for publication, of which you appear to have satisfied yourselves without referring to my... And then there's a German word that I don't understand. Abs, abstammung? Maybe he's just mocking them. I trust that you will find this reply satisfactory and remain yours faithfully, J.R.R. Tolkien. <laughs> That's incredible. I had no idea that was a thing. Because uh, a, 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 a lot of, thinking, like, you know, right-wing, like, European, white, nationalist, fascist, Nazi types are pretty keen to try and claim Tolkien in the same way Wagner has claimed, but Tolkien himself in his lifetime went to, as you've just read out, significant pains to distance himself from that it, in the strongest terms possible, really. Like he's 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 not unclear there. That's one of the best things I think I've I've read. But he basically said, "Are you Jewish?" He's like, "I kind of wish I was." <laughs> like, like there is he he couldn't state that more clearly than he has done. That's brilliant. 
I don't like um we say a lot that's critical of Tolkien like folks but like obviously we love his work we think he's a tremendous figure we'll talk more about his life later on um, I didn't know much about him his personal life until very recently but there's some tremendous stories about him this may be the best <laughs> one that I've read that, that, that's brilliant I thought you might have come across that in your I readings support- but yeah no this is brilliant like I, I can't believe that like Christopher Tolkien left this out of the history of the Lord of the Rings this is so relevant yeah I guess that's more for him that's I, I you know it's not the history of the Lord of the Rings it's just what his father was like yeah, I know that we like we spoke in a great length about the uncomfortable role of race in the Lord of the Rings, and Tolkien does use race as kind of literary shorthand for certain characteristics, which is not great. You can see why the Nazis why was... would want him on their side. Put it that way. Yeah, but equally, apparently, he was praised within even just the publication of the Lord of the Rings that like he was resistant to the notion of eugenics. Like the Lord of the Rings is filled with like mixed marriages and like. People from I mean, yeah, they keep constantly coming back to the whole Romeo and Juliet style of thing of like between elf and man. Like, yep, um, like Beren and Luthien yeah. and Aragorn and Arwen. A... But more than that, like he he presents like an explicitly multicultural and multi ethnic society, which I'd never really considered. I think prior to like me doing the research for this the show, that that was uh, that was also a bit so on the that... unusual side for his time, I think. Yeah, so on the one hand, the way he depicts orcs and the black skin and like ape-like descriptions of orcs, uncomfortable, not great. But by the same token, it was radical for his time that he presents a multicultural, multi-ethnic society within his work of It reminds fans. me of, so I was reading an interesting thing recently. It was a, a statement from, I think it's the, the Board of Deputies of British Jews or someone like that about... Um, J.K. Rowling and the whole thing with how she presents goblins and basically they yeah. were asked like do you think Rowling is, is anti-semitic for this and they basically said no I don't think she's anti-semitic like the problem is the fact that there is a rich tradition of Jews having like goblin like traits in European mythology and the problem is basically that someone like Rowling could draw on those traits without even realising that they're anti-semitic there is the problem the problem isn't in the person necessarily using them the problem is that someone cannot even realize that because those like the idea is you know goblins are thieving little things who love gold and have hooked noses the fact that you can just that's so common that level of essentially anti-semitism is so commonplace that you cannot notice is the problem i think that's a very intelligent and nuanced reply to the claims of anti-Semitism against Rowling. I mean, God knows, J.K. Rowling is guilty of <laughs> yeah, let's, a lot of let's things. Not, let's not, not do a deep dive into J.K. Rowling, I think, yeah. I mean, like, the, the, the least of J.K. Rowling's crimes is that she wrote, like, what are quite average children's books, which I nevertheless love. But, um, yeah. It's interesting that you bring up the notion of, like, anti-Semitism, because this 1964 interview that I, I've been describing throughout this series, again, go watch a viewership. It's really quite interesting, even though Tolkien's a terrible interview subject. But like um, he explicitly describes the dwarves, and he intentionally devised them this way. He wanted them to seem Jewish. The dwarves, like, and he says really, it really yeah. But oh, really we, sorry, like, we just collected pipe weed. <laughs> Let's get fucking oh, blazed. Yes. <laughs> well, I've actually got a bunch of notes, like for later on, we're, we're going to discuss the use of drugs in the Lord Excellent. of the Rings because it's it's fuck it's fucking rampant. They're all high all <laughs> sorry, the time. Continue. But um, he explicitly describes dwarves as like he wanted them to seem like they were Jewish. Like, because um, the interviewer asks him, like, oh, did you draw on real world racial characteristics when you were writing the novel? And I- I'm assuming he's gesturing towards the descriptions of orcs, because that's yeah. the most obvious one. But Tolkien just dodges it and he says, oh, yeah, like the dwarves. And the interviewer's like, well, no, not really. But Tolkien just talks over him and says, oh, yeah, I deliberately wanted, like, um, the dwarves to embody the kind of like Jewish feel. You know, like, um, I- this is Tolkien's words. He says, the love of artifact and the love of, like, you know, mechanisms and mm. things like that. I'm like, he, but he means it as a compliment. It's still, I, I don't want to comment whether that's anti-Semitic. Tolkien clearly intends it as a compliment. Whether it is or not, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think there's a lot of potential criticisms that can level up against Tolkien, but I don't think anti-Semitism is one of them particularly, especially given his earlier rebukes of the Nazis. <laughs> 